thank you very much um, for coming. This is an event that uh, I first imagined three years ago when we were projecting forward to the, uh, to the centenary of the publication of Ulysses on February 2nd, uh, 1922, and we had recently been grant given a first edition copy of Ulysses as a gift to Ireland House, and I said we should honor that gift with, uh, with some way to recognize the centenary, and the first person that I thought of who should be here was my friend and, and colleague Joe Valenti, um, who has done more to impact the way that I think about uh, Ulysses and indeed to think about, um, uh, about Irish literature and, and about the, the value of, of doing literary studies in the contemporary world. Um, I was mentioning my brother, my, Michael, my oldest brother, and he uh, introduced me to a number of great things around the time I was 17. The first was Flann O'Brien, and the second was Frank Zappa. And it's the Frank Zappa that I want to mention in the context of tonight's lecture, because to my uh, way of thinking, Frank Zappa combined two things that are rarely ever combined, extraordinary technical precision and incredibly detailed craft on the one hand, and wild, unpredictable, brilliant improvisation at the same time. And uh, it's in that context that I always think of Joe Valenti as the Frank Zappa of literary criticism. Um, he's incredibly precise and detailed in everything that he says and all his thoughts, but he's also incredibly wildly improvisationally unpredictable and brilliant. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome my friend here. Uh, but to welcome him properly, I'm going to ask my friend Richard Aldersley to say a few words and introduce Joe. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, John. Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Uh, thank you for coming to this event uh, being hosted by the Modern and Contemporary Colloquium. This event is being hosted by MAC, which has been at the heart of NYU for actually since 2005. It's one of the longest running working groups uh, at NYU that I'm aware of, and it's certainly the longest one in the English department. So thank you for coming. And I must admit, it's great to be back. Uh, we haven't had any MAC events for a couple of years for obvious reasons, but uh, thanks for coming. Um, really, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Joseph Valenti to you today, but I must admit that it is a rather daunting task to do so. How might one synthesize the career of somebody who has been so productive and whose body of work has been so deep and so wide that it might well take, as Joyce himself would put it, 100 years to explore adequately? It is for these reasons that you are probably already familiar in some way with his work, with his many books, editions, and over 70 articles which have given a new architecture to Irish studies and cultivated critical thinking well beyond the pale. But in the improbable event that you may not have heard of Joseph Valenti and his work, one thing should be stated outright. The volume, the versatility, and the verve of his work testify to a simple fact, that he's passionate about his subject, he's passionate about his fellowship. As John said, he's got the Frank Zappa touch. And I have no doubt that we shall see that passion here today. Joseph Valenti is UB Distinguished Professor of English and Disability Studies at the University at Buffalo. He is the author of The Child Sex Scandal and Modern Irish Literature, writing The Unspeakable as well as The Myth of Manliness in Irish Nationalist Culture, 1880 to 1922. As an editor, he has provided us with an annotated edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula and with Marjorie Howes, Yeats, and afterwards along with several special issues of preeminent journals like the James Joyce Quarterly, in each case bringing together areas of expertise, different areas of expertise, to illuminate texts and elaborate context with critical variety. For decades, he has remained at the cutting edge of Irish studies, and his 1994 essay, Thrilled by His Touch, Homosexual Panic and the Will to Artistry in a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, has been reprinted several times. It was named also by the James Joyce Quarterly as one of the most influential essays in James Joyce studies and remains essential reading to this day. Joyce has been integral to Valenti's work, just as Valenti's work has been integral to Joyce studies, two centers of gravity pulling each other toward reinvention. Standing, too, at the forefront of contemporary disability studies, 
Professor Valenti is currently at work on a monograph entitled Autism and Moral Authority in Modern Literature, as well as a book-length study of Samuel on study of Samuel Beckett and the degeneration of form, and another still on the subject of Irish shame. What unites all this work is not merely a methodological virtuosity when it comes to revealing unexpected overlaps and exchanges between representational strategies, drawing novel connections between um, in convoluted contexts. There has also been within it all an unwavering commitment to tackling issues of social violence, many of which remain with us today. He reminds us that our study of the civic function of literary efforts does not so much begin, but end with us, and that the question of social justice must always be conjugated into the present tense. I believe I speak with all of us here today when I say that I'm really keen to hear Joseph Valenti speaking on Joyce for the centenary celebration of Ulysses. So please welcome me in giving Professor Valenti a hearty round of applause. I just want to start by responding in a little bit to these incredibly generous, fulsome, hyperbolic introductions. <laughs> uh, no lie, I'm a huge Frank Zappa fan myself, and not more than a few months ago, I was talking with my wife, and I said, you know, Frank Zappa is the James Joyce <laughs> of, of contemporary music. So, to be care compared to this. Um, the other one, a more serious note, this, this talk is taking place in, in, a, in a certain, obviously, a certain geopolitical moment. And I just want to, to reflect on that briefly. In the immediate advent of World War II, James Joyce said, complained to friends of his, that if people would just read Finnegan's Wake, there wouldn't be a war. Now, whether they whether, whether there, there was a war because they they didn't, I don't think so. I think that we have to recognize that literature, while never politically negligible, is also not necessarily politically decisive. Um, and and we also have to do, I think, combine two things here, though. One is that within this grand gross atrocity of mass violence, we can't forget that there are other forms and instances of violence going on all the time, on an everyday basis. And we also have to recognize that celebration is something we have to do, and that if we waited until there was no violence to celebrate anything, we would never celebrate anything. And I'm hoping that my talk will be both celebration, at one level, and an interrogation of a particular representation of a kind of violence and uh, the way it plays itself out. So we'll see. Um, just let me, okay, okay. Um, any formal reflection on the centenary of James Joyce's Ulysses will almost inevitably address the novel's astounding, accelerating cultural currency 100 years on. How has Ulysses not only attained but maintained and even continued to burnish its place in the pantheon of modern literature? How has it managed to achieve such a rare combination of prestige and popularity, to speak and to be heard in both forbiddingly arcane and sportively demotic registers? How does it, does it exert such a fascination across decades of social upheaval and rearrangement in diverse cultural frameworks? To be sure, Ulysses is not the only narrative fiction to earn an enduringly iconic status, to win devotion in different national contexts and among widely divergent audiences, but I am not at all sure that any single literary text has been the object of ritualized celebration and recitation in the same degree, magnitude, and regularity as Ulysses has been, particularly over the last 40 years. The hold Ulysses has on the literate imagination is, in kind and intensity, all but unprecedented. Now, Ulysses' popularity was as remarkable for its deferral as it has been in its fruition. It spent upwards of three decades in the wilderness of censorship and widespread neglect in English-speaking countries. In 1959, with Ulysses finally emerging into full public view, Richard Ullman responded to this history with the famous declaration 
we are still learning to be Joyce's contemporaries, by which he meant, at least in part, we are still learning how to read Joyce's magnum opus. In this second phase of Ulysses' reception, learning to read the novel meant mastering Joyce's art of illusion, what T.S. Eliot called his mythic method, tracing the signature Homeric correspondences, biblical parallels, Shakespearean intertexts, operatic soundtracks, etc. through the novel. But while this largely academic exercise undoubtedly raised the profile of Joyce's Dublin Odyssey, Ulysses only came into the limelight as the, quote, novel of the century after the last centenary, that of Joyce's birth in 1982, which began the third phase of the novel's reception. At that point, a strategy for approaching Ulysses emerged, of which the following well-known intervention by Jacques Derrida was, while not necessarily the catalyst, at least a serviceable bridge. I quote, we find all the gestures to take the initiative of a movement announced in a superpotentiated text. Everything was said in advance, narrated in advance in its dated singularity by this hypernemesic machine capable of storing in a giant epic work the very traces of the future." End quote. At first glance, the sense of this passage might seem content continuous with Elman's statement that we are still learning to say what Ulysses has already said. But once we be Dig a bit deeper, we find that Derrida's analysis runs directly counter to Elman's in several decisive respects. Firstly, it bespeaks a crucial turn in Joyce studies, from learning to read Ulysses to learning how Ulysses reads us, how it holds up a textual mirror to our gestures of initiative. As Derrida's reference to a superpotentiated text indicates, however, these anticipations of our interpretive concerns are merely adverted to or adumbrated in Ulysses rather than fully executed or elaborated. Whereas learning to read Ulysses meant grappling with Joyce's pervasive use of illusions, which typically bear an archival aspect, gathering traces of the literary and cultural past, learning how Ulysses can read us means assimilating Joyce's use of proleptic illusions or prelusions, which deposit traces of the future, notional tracts of inquiry for his readers to pursue. For Elman, the presumptively inherent greatness of Ulysses and the social appreciation of that greatness were aligned, albeit on a stagger. The greatness of Ulysses resided in the text all along, and we just gradually came to apprehend his character. The implication of Derrida's insight points to a more complex orthogonal relationship between the two, which I would couch as follows. The socially recognized greatness of Ulysses resides in its multigeneric, polyphonic, culturally omnivorous, compellingly humorous, altogether encyclopedic depiction of historically grounded sociopolitical and psychosexual realities in play at a particular time and place, what Marilyn French denominated the text as world. The continuing social currency of that greatness, however, derives in large part from a structural latency that is the residual effect of the novel's encyclopedic nature. That is, its accommodation of an indefinite series of unintended, historically adaptive reformulations of those same realities. Precisely insofar as Ulysses is an all-encompassing representation of daily life in late metrocolonial Dublin, it touches upon virtually every issue or problematic that has come to us from that cultural moment, now to be assumed under such categories as feminism, post-colonialism, and nationalism, sexual normativity and queerness, racial science and eugenics, commercial capitalism and cultural revivalism, and those categories propagated in the so-called New Joy studies like eco-criticism, disability, and globalism. Nevertheless, or rather for that very reason, Ulysses cannot be reduced to a post-colonial novel, a queer novel, a feminist novel, a patriarchal novel, a revivalist novel, an eco-novel, etc. It is always less and more than each of these, not fully any one and always something other as well. Ulysses does, however, give itself to being interpretably refashioned along each of these lines, and it has been, incredibly so. By way of those proleptic illusions or prelusions, Ulysses offers the reader prompts for such contemporary reconstruction, rather like a kit book. As Joyce himself told Frank Budgeon, he was pleased to see people, quote, read more into Ulysses than I ever intended, and who is to say they are wrong, end quote. So among the many things Ulysses foretells, one might say, is fan fiction, albeit in the mode of literary criticism. We remake Ulysses with contemporary analytic tools and in the service of contemporary interests and concerns, 
but we do so under the direction of the text itself, enabling its narrative figures to function as prefigurations of our present. As a result, Ulysses has accrued over the past decade something of a prophetic aura. Its seeming predictiveness, however, those anticipations of our initiatives that Derrida remarked, are better understood as the mark of its promptitude in both senses of the term. The novel's prompts to the reader, answerable to our evolving interests and intellectual commitments, ask us to fathom our present by its lights, and in so doing, they keep the novel itself prompt, ever timely rather than timeless, on time, with the promptings of its audience. Now, one of my recent interests has been the concrete manifestations of this timeliness. In figuring forth, however synoptically, our contemporary cultural investments and modes of analysis, Ulysses also proves relevant to the topical affairs that these investments and modes of analysis are called upon to frame, treat, and critique. In a, nine, in a 2019 article for Air Ireland, uh, Reading Joyce in the Age of Trump, I endeavored to demonstrate as much taking the, retro, the racial politics of the Cyclops episode as prototypical of the ruses of populism informing the MAGA movement. Today, to show the pertinence of Ulysses for our present day culture of sexual harassment, and vice versa, I will be reading certain adventures of the modern Odysseus by the light of Me Too, in order to consider the possible need for a profound revision in our apprehension of the novel, whether and how far we must alter our estimation of the hero, whose name is eponymous, if not synonymous, with the annual celebration of Ulysses, i.e. Bloomsday. Should Leopold Paul Bloom continue to bide in our affections as a modest but likable exemplar of modern decency, a mensch, or will the imputation of sexual harassment and exploitation come to temper that good will? The trials of Leopold Bloom, as my self-title has it, occur in a tripartite sequence of phantasmagoric sexual crime and punishment in Circe, the climactic episode of Ulysses. The interlude happens to climax in an accidental, yet uncannily apt, foretoken, an unusually spot-on proleptic illusion of the Me Too movement's signature motto. Mrs. Yelperton Bowery, arrest him, constable! He made improper overtures to me to misconduct myself. Miss Bellingham, he urged me to commit adultery at the earliest opportunity. Miss Mervyn Talboys, he urged me to do likewise, to misbehave, to soil his letter in an unspeakable manner, to chastise him as he richly deserves, to give him a vicious horse whipping. Mrs. Bellingham, me too. Mrs. Yelverton Bower, me too. As this passage indicates, Bloom's alleged sexual offenses never surface directly, but are only registered in ex post facto victim testimony, a familiar predicament in the Me Too era, but one that in this case makes for especially tricky proffers. On the one hand, the dramatic persona leveling grievances against Bloom in this scene, Mar Martha Clifford, Mary Driscoll, and these Anglo-Irish society ladies that I just cited, all constitute phantasmatic projections of Bloom's unconscious, as do his feeble attempts at refutation. On the other hand, the victim's allegations are ex post facto, not only in the sense of being retrospective, coming after the fact, and thereby eluding direct observation, but also in the sense of coming after the fact, of having some basis, like the Me Too cases generally, in the all too accepted reality of sexual harassment and assault i.e. of referring, directly or laterally, to an actuality beyond Circe's phantasmagorical theater in which they appear and come to judgment. As such, these reports harbor a certain confusion between memory and fantasy that has bedeviled the adjudication of sexual abuse going back to Freud's seduction theory. On Bloom's Walpurgis Nacht, of course, the ostensibly real memories of being harassed, exploited, or worse, unfold within a fantasy, Bloom's own fantasy of being accused of performing the abusive acts. Since this fantasy represents a complex mediation, uh, division, revision, distortion, displacement, of real memories by likewise real, if obscure, desires, proclivities, kinks, etc., bringing Bloom to book, a la Me Too, requires a nice calibration of the psychic motives behind this hallucinatory scandal theater. Does it constitute a compromised discharge of a confessional impulse? Or the conflictual fulfillment of a masochistic wish? A nightmare suffered or a dream come true? 
the expression or the expiation of a sexual appetite? These questions loom large for how we might regard Bloom and our past regard for Bloom in the wake of Me Too. Post Me Too readers will find their reaction to Bloom's reputed offenses parodically enacted on the virtual boards of the Searcy stage. A bill of indictment is entered against Bloom, who faces a phantasmatic tribunal, an antic jury, and a scornful newspaper presence. The juridical proceedings, risedly absurdist as they may be, cannot properly be discounted as farcical, since they do not operate to diminish the gravity of the conduct in question. To the contrary, the scene derives its humor from a hyperbolic censure of Bloom and his perceived, or rather self-perceived, transgressions, a mob denunciation that seems unduly harsh rather than dismissive. Notwithstanding Bloom's objections, however, he is not simply, quote, being made a scapegoat of, end quote. What transpires in the fantasy sequence, though peremptory and punitive, is neither arbitrary nor entirely invidious. Neither the reality nor the severity of Bloom's punitive wrongdoing is disproven or dispelled by the patent courtroom displays of ethnic bigotry of the kind he has suffered all day. For all that, the dream sequence remains a prosecution comically enacted rather than a persecution. So while we post Me Too readers cannot take at all seriously the cartoonish rush to judgment that Bloom incurs, let alone his outlandish sentence, quote, hanged by the neck until dead, end quote, we cannot but take seriously the necessity of judgment that these carnivalesque proceedings countersign. The madcap mise-en-scene of the trial grants the reader an ironic distance from its findings while implicitly enjoining the reader to determine their own. It does not prescribe the facts of the judgment represented in the text, but it does prescribe an act of judgment on the reader's part. Here again, Ulysses opens toward the future of the Me Too movement, this time as a matter of public interest, consumption, and intervention. Like the narrative swirling about Bloom's mock trial in Circe, the stories told by various plaintiffs and defendants of Me Too notoriety primarily address the court of public opinion, where they command our attention and implicate us ineluctably in forming a judgment. Whether experienced actively or tacitly, in print or on social media, by commission or omission, the registering of a decision in such cases is inevitable, while the substance of the decision may not be. That is to say, the defining implication of Me Too as a broad-based grassroots megaphone for the voices of the sexually victimized to make it impossible not to come to some sort of judgment on the reported incidents. Silence is violence. To make any reaction or non-reaction weigh as an ethical determination, crediting, rejecting, or doubting a given version of events, affirming, assenting to, or discounting their magnitude or importance. Moreover, because Me Too does not focus just on sexual wrongdoing, but on the sexual abuse of power, it has provided amplified access to testimony incriminating prominent figures, celebrities, politicians, intellectuals, moguls, who have long commanded our favor and respect and whose alleged knavery now demands a reconsideration of our feelings about them. As we shall see, Leopold Bloom is vulnerable, though not necessarily doomed to reappraisal, reappraisal on these grounds as well. At the same time that Me Too compels us to judge both the incidents and the parties thereto, since even the refusal to do so bears evaluative currency, we are condemned to rely on incomplete and often conflicting information, on different shadings of the facts, on evidence more or less convincing but rarely dispositive. Just as with the cacophony of voices accusing and defending Bloom in the Circe episode, to hear and heed the voices of Me Too de depositions is often to find oneself cast in the role of a properly, because imperfectly, ethical subject, compelled to risk doing an injustice in the, more likely, service of justice, to arrive at a decision despite some minimal ineradicable degree of undecidability, to take a leap across what Joyce and Ulysses called the void incertitude, where ethics and hermeneutics meet.
Because, because Joyce built this incertitude into Ulysses as both a creative principle and an interpretive spur, the novel provides an unusually apt literary training ground for reading a social phenomenon and affair du scandal like Me Too. One area where the Me Too style arraignment of Bloom and the Me Too of our contemporary moment differ lies in the source of the voices calling for justice. Unlike the voices of Me Too, the voices accusing and defending Bloom and Circe both emanate from within, even as they externalize his unconscious. Whereas in Me Too, any residual undecidability of justice derives from a contest of participant voices on the actions taken, effects felt, and harm suffered, the undecidability of justice in Bloom's case stems from the overlap of fact and fantasy in the generation of the voices themselves. Instead of the classic he said, she said, what is labeled the courtroom of conscience in Circe houses an exchange of he said, the ventriloquized other said, in which the conflict exists within Bloom's mind, across the fault lines of memory, imagination, and desire, and among several possible unconscious motives for what gets said, acted, or hallucinated. It is precisely owing to this atypical framework that Circe not only represents Me Too's shadow cast before, but sheds new light on its aftermath. Post Me Too, we need to attune ourselves ever more closely to Circe's illumination of the uncertain connection between sexual fantasy, particularly male sexual fantasy, and sexual exploit as objects of ethical judgment. Are sexually domineering or exploitative fantasies, for example, fuel for, deferrals of, or prophylactics against the sexual abuse of power impeached in Me Too? And are these fantasies accordingly liable to a like severity of reprobation as the actions they envisaged? Or is discretion in the policing of the imagination the better part of virtue. The trial sequence in Circe is particularly challenging on this score because it proves at once the crowning imaginary projection of Bloom's unconscious libido and ground zero for the interrogation of his actual checkered history of sexual dalliance. The complex relationship between these two dimensions, crucial to questions of sexual ethics in Ulysses, is a microcosm of the relationship that the climactic episode in Night Town bears to the day preceding it, which has been a matter of much scholarly deliberation. Borrowing from and inching forward that critical heritage, I propose that Circe turns the psychic life, Bloom's psychic life, Stephen's psychic life, but psychic life, on exhibit in the earlier episodes Inside Out, in the manner of a Mobius strip. The stream of Bloom's daytime consciousness is underpinned by unconscious fantasies that twist their way onto the surface in Circe, having taken as their manifest content Bloom's daytime impulses, perceptions, memories, and musings. With regard to the Me Too scenario, Joyce gives this Mobian strip dynamic narrative visibility in a series of correspondences between three differently classed plaintiffs in, Joyce, in Bloom's mock trial and three likewise classed women who magnetize his daytime fantasies. The Anglo-Irish societies, society ladies, whom I quoted at the outset, are dream avatars of a haughty creature ogled early that morning by Bloom outside the Grosvenor Hotel as she awaits conveyance to her country estate. Martha Clifford, whom Bloom has engaged in a flirtatious epistolary correspondence, plays herself in Night Town, standing on the wronged middle-class respectability that Bloom ascribes to her. Finally, the neighborhood serving girl, whom Bloom voyeuristically stalked that morning on the way home from Duglock's butcher shop, serves as a screen image for Mary Driscoll, Bloom's dismissed servant and the centerpiece of the Me Too style case. Her apparition turns up in the mock 
courtroom to level the most disturbing, damaging, and circumstantially plausible charge of sexual harassment against him. These correspondences pivot on the socioeconomic status of the women involved, ranging across the ethnic and class hierarchy of Dublin. As such, they foreground a firm yet fluctuating bond between sexual practice and social privilege, both in Bloom's mind and in the cultural imaginary he instances. The delicate counterpoint of the factual and the fantasy aspect of Bloom's libidinous deportment is traversed by a choreography of the different social ranks that he and his accusers occupy or assume within the sex power system. Bloom projects his erotic fantasies onto the authoritative social hierarchy that informs them from the start and then serves to police their every possible realization, to demarcate approved from forbidden objects, safely encouraged from thrillingly transgressive overtures, healthy from pathological longings. On one side, the routing of Bloom's erotic fantasies through the grid of ethnic, class, and gendered positions underscores an important consideration in our contemporary reading of Me Too, that the offending incidents may constitute clear violations of the social order, while remaining consistent, distressingly so, with its hierarchical structure. On the other side, given Bloom's flagrantly masochistic predilections, the answerability of his erotic fantasies to the authority of this social structure broaches a salient question for a Me Too reading of Circe's mock trial. Do the phantoms that Bloom summons to his burlesque tribunal function in the mode of self-conviction to bear witness to his sexual exploits, real and imaginary, as seen from the perspective of the social regime whose moral norms Bloom has internalized, even in their breach? Or rather, does the authority that Bloom conjures forth function primarily to place those sexual exploits in a harsh light that can earn Bloom the punitive, self-shattering fulfillment he plainly seeks, a frenzied, masochistic jouissance of correction? In what direction, we might ask, does Bloom's manifold fantasy primarily tend? Does he court pers- prosecution for his sexual proclivities? Or does he court prosecution as a sexual proclivity? Me too as self-indictment, or me too as self-incitement? And if we take the unconscious fantasy life of today's Me Too defendants, will we find a similarly fraught ambivalence motivating abusive conduct that tempts the increasingly likely possibility of legal sanction and public opprobrium? Masochistic desire, which we can all agree forms a major and conspicuous thread in the Mobius strip of Bloom's psychic life, has, since Freud's study, the economic problem of masochism, been regularly understood to have a bipolar cast. A, the need to expiate guilt for forbidden desires and practices, and B, the unconscious manufacture of guilt feelings, guiltiness, to justify the chastisement that brings sexual excitement and bliss. Initially, it was felt that the masochists took pleasure from punishment and humiliation as a means of atoning for misdeeds and assuaging actual guilt. Alternatively, and in turn, the masochist has been read as assuming guiltiness, as a warrant to receive pleasure in punishment. The interpretive choice between these hedonic itineraries goes a long way toward establishing the standards and evidence on which Bloom faces post-Me Too judgment. This is especially the case inasmuch as the choice implicates a distinction of great import for sexual ethics generally, and Me Too in particular, between unconscious thought and deliberate action, what unfolds in the dimension of fantasy, and what occurs performatively in the dimension of material consequence. And where, between these poles, the practices of representation might figure. Whether and how what goes on in the mind translates into worldly activity and vice versa is an important question throughout Ulysses. 
repeatedly referenced by Stephen Dedalus, but nowhere so much as in Circe. Here, the memory of actual past events occasions the projection of the phantas- phantasmal present, wherein those memories are so transformed and distorted as to blur without in any way effacing the original event. The two indictments against Bloom that extend specific, historically verifiable, erotic transactions between Bloom and the plaintiffs, Martha Clifford and Mary Driscoll, intermix mnemonic and imaginary information, but in different proportions, inviting the reader to take stock of how Bloom's masochistic propensities motivate, imbue, and or substantiate the charges of sexual transgression. First, the wraith of Martha Clifford, the woman with whom Bloom has been sharing an erotic correspondence based on a personal act, claims that he has sullied her name and committed a, quote, breach of promise, end quote, against her. That the epistolary dalliance is still ongoing on June 16, 1904, renders the charge, breach of promise, spurious on its face, though it may say something about future as yet unconscious intentions on Bloom's part. But does Bloom feel, as Margot Norris and others have claimed, a buried self-reproach for using Martha as a, quote, fantasy dominatrix, end quote? The first question to be pondered on this point is whether fantasy should be subject to the same sort of ethical surveillance and censure as express attitudes and conduct. Consider, the element of psychic exploitation, of which Bloom stands accused, proves not only endemic, but indispensable to sexual fantasy, conscious or unconscious. The make-believe conjuring forth of the other for purposes of gratification all but defines the genre. By the same token, Erotic desire, attraction, and enjoyment all depend upon and unfold within the framework of fantasy. So that to disqualify fantasy and its appropriation, or appropriations, on ethical grounds would serve to sanitize sexuality as such out of existence. Even joint fantasy remains a matter of mutual pretense and appropriation rather than a consummate meeting of the minds. That said, the fact that Bloom and Martha have been con- concocting their epistolary fantasy in concert does substantially decrease the likelihood that Bloom's intimations of self-reproach are genuine, guilt, as opposed to masochistically counterfeited, guiltiness. If anything, the letter Bloom receives from Martha earlier that day, wherein she assumes the role of dominatrix, indicates that her part in the S&M titillation is every bit as voluntary and vigorous as his own. To cast her as a victim rather than a participant, is to dispute her purchase on the sexual agency she affects. Such a reading might be seen to articulate a Me Too agenda of all the letter, but it also takes that agenda to the verge where it would compromise its own feminist impetus. The self-reproach that supposedly fuels Bloom's summoning forth of Martha's persona, moreover, is belied by the substance of the apparitional interlude itself. If Bloom was indeed guilt-stricken by his psychic abuse of Martha, why would his fantasy seek a warrant for punishment in a fabricated and unrelated misdeed? If his self-perceived insult to Martha's honor was sufficient for the discipline he covets, why would he need to dream up a crime, breach of promise, well beyond the pale of their continuing remote intrigue? Viable answer to these questions can only come if we view the idea of guilt as what Deleuze called a theatrical basis for the punishment sought and its attendant thrills. Moreover, let us remember that masochism pervades Bloom's entire recorded intercourse with Martha from the beginning. I quote, I do wish I could punish you, so now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, end quote. That is to say, the hallucinatory projections of Martha's plaint are of a self-mortifying piece with the affair itself. Her ventriloquized testimony signals no repentance on Bloom's part of his past dealings with her, but rather an extension and enhancement of their masochistic tenor.
It is with the aim of intensifying his masochistic jouissance, and in a manner characteristic of the perversion, that Bloom spectacularizes his suffering and humiliation. Far from secreting his treatment of Martha out of guilt, the trials in Bloom's reverie completes his self-demeaning transaction with her by putting his abjection on display in a definitively public venue. To render his offenses severe enough to be worthy of public attention, however, he casts, and maybe must cast, his erotic overtures to Martha along misleadingly nefarious lines that would meet the community benchmarks of sexual offenses worthy of obloquy at the least and torment at best. In doing so, however, his fantasy not only betrays the complicity of his, of his desire with the social hierarchies and inequities of Dublin life, but also, in a classic foreshadowing of Me Too, the complicity of the hierarchical social order in accommodating certain predatory sexual visitations. As noted, the standards of ethical judgment on Bloom's naughty dreamscape, registered in the text, are notoriously class-determined. The behaviors that incur sanction the severity of the sanction meted out, etc., all vary with the social position of the female complainants relative to Bloom's own. In this regard, Bloom's fantasies merely reflect his internalized sense of the social terrain that informs them. Thus, whereas those imagined letters of sexual provocation to the Anglo-Irish society ladies, which I quoted at the beginning, are sufficient to demonstrate by themselves an impertinence and effrontery meriting a, quote, vicious horse-whipping, end quote, his offense against Martha must evidently exceed that of the actual flirtatious letters themselves to earn similar punishment from the notional authorities. Precisely because Bloom's motive is neither the expression nor the expiation of guilt, but the exploitation of guilt, his fantasies aim at doing whatever is required to rouse a super-egoic social other, embodied in the constables, and in seriously, aptly named the first and second watch. That's what the constables' names are. According to his own unconscious barometer of Dublin sexual politics, Bloom must not only manufacture retroactively an actionable injury to Martha's professed middle-class respectability, he must outrage that respectability within the hallucinatory charade itself. Bloom, quote, We are engaged, you see, Sergeant. Lady in the case. Love entanglement. He shoulders the second watch gently. Dash it all. It's a way we gallants have. I'll introduce you, Inspector. She's game. Do it in the shake of a lamb's tail. End quote. And a bit later, she's drunk. The woman is inebriated. End quote. The second watch's reply to this last calumny, quote, You ought to be thoroughly well ashamed of yourself. End quote. Carries an ironic charge for Bloom aspires precisely to a state of shame in the eyes of such an authoritative figure. Understood as a disavowed strategy of enjoyment, rather than an unconscious symptom of guilt, Bloom's masochism presents to a Me Too-style inquiry a parallax self-image, the kind given by those funhouse mirrors at the entry of Night Town, which introduced Bloom as both lovelorn, long-lost, lugubri, bloom, and jolly, po- jolly poldy, the Rick Sticks doldy. From one angle, Bloom's fabrications perpetrate upon Martha's profile a symbolic violence that his original epistolary exchange with her does not. Where Martha is a consensual participant in those titillating letters, she has been conscripted here as a mere prop and a slandered prop to boot in Bloom's Saturnalia. From another angle, his condescending denigration of Martha only comes to pass in a purposely feeble, self-defeating effort to identify and ingratiate himself with the officials of Dublin's metrocolonial patriarchy. The agents of the law, police, judge, jury, the ethnic social elite, and even the unionist regime itself. Quote, I am as staunch a Britisher as you, sir, end quote. He exclaims at one point, I fought for the colors of king and country, end quote. Of course, such adherence to the regime and its representatives entirely consists with his craving for subordination and correction. But in the broader context of the caste-bound order he supplicates, his self-presentation as a loyal confederate 
cannot but harbor a crucial counter-signification. In calibrating the nature and severity of his projected misconduct to the sliding scale of justice that his victims can expect, given their social rank, Bloom incriminates the sex power system itself, the regime behind his mock trial, in the scandal he is fashioning. In adapting his transgressive embellishment to the inequitable canons of outrage and accountability that his society upholds concerning wronged women, Bloom unwittingly exposes how instances of sexual misdemeanor come to be connived at, if not condoned, on a hierarchical basis. The symbolic violence enacted in Bloom's fantasies reflect and reflect upon the structural violence perpetrated by the system that pr- prosecutes him. Thus, by a parallactic irony, the same fabled defamation of Martha that renders Bloom a prospective object of righteous Me Too style reprobation also renders him an unconscious instrument of social critique with affirmative Me Too import. Needless to say, the proportioning of sexual offensiveness on a bias determined by the caste status of the victims tends to extenuate, if not excuse, all sexual harassment of lower-level employees by their bosses or superiors, the very heart of the Me Too remit. The complaint of Mary Driscoll represents a still more colorable matter for Me Too indictment. Like the Clifford case, Bloom's projection of Driscoll's testimony bears bears incontrovertibly on actual events. But unlike the Clifford case, the alleged events clearly involve sexual harassment and even assault. Moreover, Driscoll grieves a workplace incident, that classic Me Too scenario, in which the power differentials leave the underling all the more vulnerable for being maltreated. Mary Driscoll occupies perhaps the single most precarious rung on the social ladder of Dublin, a domestic slavey, and so is most vulnerable to precisely this tortious and tortuous quandary. Bloom has almost certainly looked to exploit her position in gifting her with, quote, emerald garters, end quote. Molly's reported discovery of these articles in her room in the Penelope episode confirms as much. That Bloom intends some measure of sexual seduction is a likewise unavoidable inference, especially given his documented lingerie fetish. With the vast power discrepancy that obtains, Bloom's gift could in itself be enough evidence for Me Too style condemnation. In the book Below Stairs, Mona Hearn denotes how the sexual predation of, quote, female servants seems to have been fairly common in Ireland, end quote. Bloom's courtroom description of the garters as, quote, far above your station, end quote, suggests that his advances proceeded on this sense of employer privilege. In performing this classist libidinal script, Bloom may be judged to have treated Mary as a kind of whore, attempting to purchase sexual favors with tokens of his social superiority. According to Hearn, the consequence of such masterly seduction was typically instant dismissal for the servant, who would then often turn to prostitution out of necessity. Partly owing to Bloom's cavalier gratuity, Mary winds up being discharged for cause, and her interrogation in the courtroom fantasy intimates the cruel irony that in treating her like a prostitute, he may have made her a member of that, quote, unfortunate class, end quote. Indeed, Bloom need not have issued nor even contemplated an overt solicitation or threat for the structurally extortionate potential of his gift to earn the reprehension of a Me Too tribunal. After all, is not Me Too ultimately about how the systemic convergence of class and gender entitlement contour acts of individual abuse? Bloom does mount a characteristically, which is to say masochistically, weak, self-incriminating defense, pointing out that he invited Mary Driscoll to sit dinner with his family, treated her as a daughter, and, quote, took her part, end quote, when she was, quote, accused of pilfering oysters, end quote, and ultimately dismissed, a grim fate that Molly Bloom, relying on classist stereotypes no less invidious than Leopold's, cruelly imposed for the supposed theft. But this is also the one point on which the defendant Bloom discernibly confesses guilt rather than mustering guilt for perverse gratification. That is to say, Bloom feels blameworthy for the repercussions 
he sought, in the end, to abort, which only testifies to the subtly yet deeply compromised nature of the sexual ethics that Bloom espouses. The upshot is not, as Casey Lawrence has proposed, that, quote, even good men can be guilty of sexual harassment, end quote. It is rather that the elements of sexual harassment are so woven into the everyday life that Ulysses depicts that an exemplary reputation for decency and the positive self-image it sanctions can weather implications of sexual harassment and yet remain relatively unscathed. And isn't that the sort of assumed, unearned immunity that Me Too is also about criticizing? Of course, the gift of garters is not the offense complained of in Driscoll's imagined testimony, but rather brutal sexual molestation. Quote, I was discolored in four places as a result, end quote. A charge that is debatable to the point of disbelief. Nothing in our experience of Bloom's sensitivity to the plight of animals, the seagulls, the disabled, the blind stripling, or women in distress, Josie Breen, Mina Purefoy, and nothing in his sexual history, from Molly to Gertie McDowell to Bridie Kelly, gives reason to credit accusations of physical violence against him. Indeed, Bloom famously endorsed taunts on his manhood by the citizen, citizen and others in the Cyclops episode for persisting in his comprehensive advocacy of nonviolence. By contrast, we have seen that Bloom will embellish, in fantasy, his situation of moral hazard in order to provoke punishment in the service of his masochistic desires. We have further seen Bloom deny unfounded allegations maladroitly, maladroitly, as here, so as not to spoil the perverse game of guilty pleasure. In the larger picture, this slippage between a genuine ethical lapse, the garters, and a fictive criminal offense, the battery, ambiguates the nature and degree of Bloom's guilt, allowing him moral relief and masochistic release simultaneously. His fantasy confounds a greater feigned culpability with a lesser authentic culpability in order to fashion a more intensely yet still credibly mortifying scenario. At the same time, fantasies do not spring forth ex nihilo, but in relation to received social scripts, and Bloom's are no exception. The master of the house assailing a reluctant service girl formed a popular topic for Dublin gossip a main source of Monica Hearn's contention that servants, quote, were often regarded as inferiors who could be abused with impunity, end quote. To the same effect, historian Dermot Federer supplies an abundance of anecdotal evidence which features the type of storyline seen in the soft core pulp fiction favored by Molly and Leopold both. The genre itself, accordingly, would have come readily to Bloom's mind as an embellishment of his contretemps with Mary Driscoll. He would also have been cognizant, however, that his embellishment was comparatively risk-free given the bourgeois privileges this storyline typically protects and the plebeian disempowerment it sustains. The 1904 trial records archived in the National Library of Ireland, revealed that in the Dublin jurisdiction only a minuscule number of sexual abuse cases generally, and even fewer involving domestic servants, ever came to trial, let alone resulted in convictions. That is to say, the Dublin courtroom itself was in practice a fantasy space for addressing this species of violation. And isn't that too, in part, the point of Me Too? The prospect of legally enforced accountability for sexual harassment and companionate assault has for too long existed mainly in the realm of mirage. Acts of sexual aggression, as a result, have retained a frisson of overstepping without the consequences for trespass. And here we can divine an analog between the theatrical show of the law in redressing sexual abuse and the theatrical show of the masochist, Bloom, in confessing to it. Where the law would be seen to exact a punishment it ultimately withholds, the masochist would be seen to endure a punishment he ultimately enjoys. Thus, Bloom's projection of being booked for domestic sexual interference, real or fabricated, rests securely upon a second line of fantasy, that the legal system would take the infraction seriously. 
Bloom can imagine himself subject to the awesome power of the state to inflict corrective pain, all the while occupying a bourgeois patriarchal order wherein he would be structurally indemnified against such infliction. Bloom's simulation of a will to suffer meets the state's simulation of a will to sentence. And Bloom evinces an unconscious recognition of just this reality. His self-identification as a gentrified gallant, combined with his offer of Martha Clifford's favor to the watch, signals his affiliation and bespeaks his solidarity with the class of gentlemen who could expect to be cleared with a wink and a nod of wrongdoing. And if Bloom's masochistic visions of his dealings with Martha Clifford exaggerate his blameworthiness, his confession in the case of Mary Driscoll speaks to a legal regime inclined to abrogate it. In this sense, Bloom's fantasized sexual aggressions can be seen to evince the condition decried by Me Too, whether or not they reflect or recall actual and actionable deeds. Bloom's fevered identification with social elites and legal authorities, has been read as a plea of innocence. Quote, can give the best references. The ex-Lord Mayor of Dublin, I have moved in the charmed circle of the highest. End quote. But by the same token, it implies a presumption of guilt redounding back upon the social order, whose charmed circle enjoys the very sort of license Bloom is alleged to have taken. Bloom's fulsome conciliatory identification with the officials in charge continues in the Driscoll case. But while Bloom willingly kisses the rod, his obeisance once again carries a double edge, openly compli compliant and subliminally critical, that reinforces the parallax view that his fantasies present to a Me Too inquiry. As his interlocutors shift from the constable to the judiciary, Bloom's groveling promise of respectability turns from the imperial military complex to British civil society and takes on an indissociably class, ethnic, and national tenor, representing himself as an, quote, acclimatized Britisher, end quote. He stakes his pledged reform on the inspiration afforded by, quote, innocent British-born bairns, youthful scholars, end quote, from, quote, the better land, end quote, who set the pace for, quote, the Colleens and Swains of Ireland, end quote. And yet Bloom's cowering gesture of assimilation to mythological forms of British life registers a critical negativity, almost despite itself, toward its object of worship. For his reverential vision of angelic British bairns modeling a spiritual ideal for their Irish subalterns, smacks so flagrantly of imperialist propaganda, specifically Britain's self-congratulatory discourse of soul-making, as to trigger the more realistic countervision of domestic colonialism, in which the Colleens and Swains of Ireland have historically been starved into emigration and servitude in Britain where they were treated no better than Mary Driscoll. Bloom's pledge of self-amendment thus resonates subtextually as a notice of kinship, evoking the similarity of Bloom's alleged, alleged sins of class exploitation and those fostered by the colonial regime standing in judgment. At different levels, Bloom's fantasies represent both complicity with and a critique of the culture of sexual miscreancy that Me Too has emerged to denounce and demolish. His is a double agency that his ensuing masochistic debauch with the Anglo-Irish society ladies, who were quoted at the outset, serves to bring home. We are now in a position to see how the formal method of Ulysses, what Derrida calls its superpotentiated quality, not only serves as a literary GPS, pointing us to grounds of contemporary interest and concern, but as a signal alerting us to the likely contests over those grounds that make them interesting and concerning. Bloom's sexual habits remain dubious in the fullest sense, questionable, but also irresolubly equivocal. His fantasies comprise indices of sexual aggression and also prophylaxis against sexual aggression.
they can be construed as reflecting his characteristic sexual tendencies and as unconscious manifestations antipathetic to those tendencies. They might represent sincere expressions of guilt over past exploits or taboo provocations to eroticize discipline for which professions of guiltiness are required predicates. They may signal his adherence to or stage a subversion of the patriarchal imperialist and imperialist order of sexual injustice at work in 1904 Dublin. By this double-handed strategy, Ulysses not only prompts a positive, proleptic, readerly engagement with the Me Too agenda, but presages the challenges the movement itself has unavoidably faced in policing a realm where the privacy of transaction and the mystifying effects of fantasy are compounded. At the same time, all of these conflicting glosses on Bloom's fantasy world are registered by participant figures within that world including Bloom himself. More than anticipating our interpretive moves without corroborating them, as Derry Dobb observes, and more than baiting our ethical and political investments without ins- assuring their pertinence, Ulysses hereby remarks, or rather premarks, the competing judgments on the actions and the characters that those investments call forth, without resolving the contest. This last instance of Joycean augury, however, does not offer us matter for discovery, but rather a matter of decision. Not the search for answers in the text, but a choice among the conflicting irreconcilable answers that the text opens up on the nature and ethical gravity of Bloom's sexual practices. Answers that in their irreconcilability can neither be fully endorsed nor entirely gainsaid. In thus forcing the reader to choose between judgments of this endlessly debatable variety The text holds up the mirror to our act of judgment itself and the inescapable limits thereon. It prods us to think about the biases attendant to our assessment of different items, the unconsidered priority we give different voices, our unexamined assumptions about the relations of fantasy, memory, and performance the attachment we have to Bloom's entrenched reputation as a good guy. It does not let us off the hook, so to speak, and thereby ensures that we remain hooked. Joyce famously declared that he had put so many enigmas and puzzles in Ulysses that it would keep the professors busy for centuries, thereby ensuring his immortality. With the first century in the book, it has become apparent that Joyce's bid for immortality rests and rests securely on his ability to catalyze the ongoing reconstruction of his text that would keep time not just with the evolution of the problems it represents, but with our efforts to address them. Me Too is among the latest and most urgent of the issues on which Joyce does not so much prophesy as enable his readers to discover prophecy. To this end, Ulysses perennially hurls the social phenomena, and the ethical-political issues of our time by reading and representing the dynamics whereby we might digest, appraise, and respond to those phenomena and those crises. In phenomenological parlance, the novel so effectively keeps pace with our worlds, the inner and the outer, by staging the processes of worlding in which they intersect. Herein, then, lies the constant that keeps Ulysses so current, as both what Joyce called a, quote, portal of discovery, end quote, and as a domain of pleasure. Herein lies the answer to the question with which we began. Why do we keep returning to Ulysses with such fervor that we seem to collectively celebrate every such return? We so enjoy knowing Ulysses, I submit, because Ulysses knows us so well. Ulysses sticks with and to us because the text reflects with seeming deliberation upon our reading of it. Indeed, looking ahead to Finnegan's Wake, the novel Joy's composed entirely out of translingual puns, it may be that one of the reasons he chose Ulysses rather than Odysseus for the title of his Homeric Chronicle was to exploit the possibility of a translingual pun. Ulysses, as the Irish say it, sounds like 
Rulisse, Rulisse in French, you read, which then becomes in English, you read. You read Ulysses, you are read by it. Thank you very much.